Hi everyone, welcome to my classroom studio here at Mason High School in Mason, Ohio. Uh, this video is going to be a video that I'm trying to show a bunch of different techniques, a comprehensive kind of approach to uh, different ways that you can glaze a pot. In fact, I'm going to show 28 different examples. In this video, I have 28 wheel thrown pots and I'm trying to show a wide variety of techniques, things that cover things like dip, pour, brush, a scrofito, mishima, all sorts of things, overlapping, um, just experimenting with some uh, different techniques that some of my students might want to use. Um, I've made this video actually for my ceramics three kids who will be glazing their pieces later this week and next week. We have a remote learning day on Wednesday of this week, so they're gonna be watching this at home so they have a better idea of what to do when they return to school later in the week. So also check in the video description. I will be having a link to a Google slide document which will show uh, the fire, finished fired pieces. Also I will have a follow-up video that shows the finished fired pieces. Um, so d do check that out and I'll have links to timestamps of the different um, techniques in the video description as well. So good luck. Shoot me any comments below that you might have and don't forget to subscribe if you want to learn more about clay. So we always start off by prepping the surface by filing off anything that might be sharp and uh, just cleaning it off with one of the abrasive stilt stones that I keep up front. Your signature or if you've carved, it's very important if you maybe you slip trailed, you can just get anything sharp off before you glaze because if it's sharp now, it will be way sharper after you have glazed it. So file that down first. Then you're going to rinse your pieces under running water. You want to make sure that it's rinsed really well to get any of the dust off. Um, if you've had dirty fingerprints, you want to get that off. And you can set it aside to dry for a couple hours or even a day. Next, you're going to prep it for possible waxing. Remember to lay a pencil flat on the table and rotate the pot. And that will give you an, a line an eighth of an inch up away from the table. You will want to do that inside and outside, and then you can wax. Now, you want to condition or moisten your wax brush before you use it. That'll make sure it's clean, and it'll allow the wax to flow off of it a little bit more easily. If you've made the pencil line, you can use that reference as a guide for when you wax. Remember, it should be up an eighth of an inch on the inside and the outside of the foot. Now, don't stack them together. Instead of direct stacking them, make sure that you uh, put a piece of paper towel in between them so you don't transfer a wax ring inadvertently to the one that's underneath. Selecting a glaze is very important. Remember that the shelf tags indicate the cart and it also says on the label where you would find those glazes and they also are color coordinated on the lid to match that shelf tag. If you see something that has like the dashed lines, like these four are part of the Archie base series, pay attention to the stop signs. It's telling you important information, such as don't put it all over the outside of a pot or it will run like crazy. Um, you will see indicators if things are good with texture or maybe uh, in the case of the Texas two coats. And I also have some other glazes as well besides the coyotes. Now, when you're glazing, you will often need a plastic tray, a whisk, which is in the whisk drawer near where the trays are. You will also probably need to get a um, measuring cup and a towel. So if you're going to work at the buckets, you will need all these things. Now, when you take the lid off the buckets, there's sometimes debris on there. So be very careful not to dump that clay dust into the glazes. Or you could say, take your orange towel and wipe that off. Just don't get the clay debris in the glazes. Now you're going to take your whisk and very vigorously whisk up that glaze. It takes a good deal of effort when the glazes have been sitting for a while to get it nice and smooth. You might also need tongs for what I'm going to show you here. This first method of dipping in a solid color is going to be using the tongs, grasping it firmly on the inside and the outside, you dip it, turn it upside down and shake it off vigorously. You can even kind of like tap it against the side of the bucket. You keep shaking upside down until it stops dripping. It might take you a minute or two. The next method is also a solid color, but this time I'm holding the edge. 
So if you hold the edge, you can dip it until you're covering almost the whole thing, except for the part where your fingers are located. And then when that dries, I will take it and I can turn it and I can get the other part. Again, that might take a few minutes because I have to allow it to dry. You also will want to uh, stir it between dips to make sure it's mixed. Next, we're going to do a brushing of the inside and the outside. First of all, condition or moisten your brush. You wanna make sure it's number one, it's clean. And again, it helps the glaze to flow a little bit better. Now, when you get a jar of glaze out, you can mix it with brushes. You could mix it with a little spatula, a whisk, or even you could use the hand mixer with one blade or beater. Um, just cover the top when you do that. Here I mixed it with the whisk and now I'm applying my glaze. When you brush, use the biggest, fattest brush that you can and you want to do three coats on each, uh, each color. So three coats with a fluffy brush inside, three coats with a fluffy brush outside. You always want to use a fluffy brush to make sure it is going on evenly. Wipe the rings of the jar off before you put the lid back on. Next one, I'm going to pour the inside. So whenever you're pouring, pour the interior before you do the exterior. And then again, hold it upside down. So you're encouraging all the drips to come off the top. You don't want it to run to the inside or you'll get a big puddle. Then I'm just tidying up with a sponge on the outside where maybe it was a little bit uneven. Now I'm going to pour the exterior. It's a little trickier to pour the exterior though. Oh, here I'm using my electric mixer. If you get a super thick glaze, like in the case of this one, I use the electric mixer. Now, in the case of this, I'm going to take my watch off because I know I would be getting it all over my watch if I didn't. So I'm holding it upside down and I'm just trying to pour over the whole thing and, uh, and shake it off. This cactus green is unfortunately fairly thick, so it's not shaking off as easily as maybe a thinner glaze would. Next method is uh, an overlap. It's a two-thirds dip and a two-thirds dip. So I dip two-thirds in the darker of the two colors that I'm going to be using, and when that's dry, I'll come back and dip two-thirds on the other side in a different color. So in the middle, it has an entire third that's overlapped. Next is the wax resist over glaze. So here I already have a glazed form and I'm just doing some wax design. I believe that steel gray chino is my base glaze on this. And after I do my wax design, I'm going to be dipping it into, I think this is desert sage that I'm using here. And um, you can see that the wax is starting to bead and make the glaze bead up. And then after that's dry, I'm going to come back in here with a sponge and then just take a little bit more off of the waxy area. So just a slightly dampened sponge will get the rest of it off the wax. So that's two layers with wax. Now I'm going to wax over just bare clay. So this is an unglazed pot. I'm doing a wax design. And as I dip it, you'll be able to see how the wax will allow the glaze to just kind of bead up on this. So you can see it's starting to separate already. And again, when that is dry, same as before, I'm going to take my sponge and just kind of lightly sponge off the areas. You'll be able to see where the wax is. It's, it's somewhat obvious because it tends to pull a little bit there. Next, we're going to do some tape resist. Now this first one, I'm going to do tape resist over bare clay, so there's no glaze there. And as you put that on there, I, I'm just trying to make my edges my, or the ends kind of meet up. I'm holding it with tongs and then I'm gonna dip it in. And this is desert sage as well that I'm using for this one. And when it's fully dry, I will be removing the tape. You could use, say, an X-Acto knife if you need to. I'm just using a needle tool. Um, I had a couple little round stickers that were like those little reinforcements that you might use on a three-ring binder paper. And 
Again, I probably should have had an X-Acto knife, but I was just using my needle tool. Now, as you pull this off, it makes a mess. Dry glaze goes everywhere, so make sure you can clean that up. Next is the same thing, except I'm putting it on a glazed pot. So this is a pot that has steel gray chino on it. And uh, after I get the tape on there, it doesn't stick quite as well as it does on the bare clay, but it, it'll still work. And then I'm going to dip this into chino. So steel gray chino with chino over it. This does create quite a bit of bubbling, but I will buff that with my hands to get all, some of the bubbles worked out a little bit on that. Now you can see the steel gray chino underneath that. Okay, next is how do you dip in a low bucket? So when the bucket is low enough that you can't really physically fit it all the way down in there, you can always tilt the bucket so it's at an angle. So you have more of a corner that you're working with that allow you to get deeper. Next is I'm going to double dip a rim in one of the Archie's Base series. Now these glazes are very particular. You can use them on the inside, you can use them on the rims, but don't use them all over. They will shiver off sometimes. Okay, so I'm dipping the uh, rim about an inch. Never go more than a third of the height of the piece. And here I just did it at about a half an inch. So not quite as deep as it was the first time. Now, as you flip it over, try not to allow it to drip. If it does drip, you want to kind of solve that so they don't drip because it'll run like crazy. Next, I'm doing blended layers that are overlapping and kind of making a blended effect. Um, so I'm blending cobalt red and then uh, violet uh, will be my three colors. So um, the little bit of a blending comes uh, toward the end of the layers when you're taking a wet brush and kind of blending them together. Next is pouring organically. So on this one I'm pulling for kind of a mountain scene and I'm doing desert sage which is a light green uh, and kind of an organic band around the middle. I should have done the interior before I did the outside but here I did the interior with the desert sage. Now I'm doing blue chino, which is a darker blue on the bottom, and I'm kind of overlapping a little bit on the desert sage. And then after that dries, then I'm going to come in here and I'm doing light chino for the upper part. So I'm trying to create sort of a mountainy kind of an effect. Okay. And just making sure I don't have any bare clay that's visible there. And then I'm just touching up a little bit on the inside where apparently I missed it. Okay, next is now I'm just going to layer full on colors. So here I'm just doing violet first. I'm not using the tongs because again, this bucket was kind of low, so I had to turn it on the corner. So I'm just doing um, where I'm getting most of it with my hand. Now I'm going to get the last corner. Okay, and as I do dip, you can see I keep a sponge in my hand. So I periodically, I'm just wiping off the bottom as I go. Okay, after the violet is dry, now I have sapphire, which is um, that real pretty celadon blue. I'm just dipping it in one coat real kind of quickly. Like when I do this, I'm probably holding it in there for about one second and then taking it out upside down uh, and just tapping it to get all of the drips off. The runnier the glaze is, you know, it might take a little bit longer for it to uh, fully drip. Next one is dipping with texture. So I'm also doing uh, a contrast glaze on the inside. So I'm putting black on the inside first. So I'm going to have two layers of color on the interior. Um, that It's better to have two on the inside than two on the outside because two on the outside of course can run. Now I'm plunging the whole thing into, I believe that's desert sage, uh, because any of the chinos are going to be excellent on texture. Uh, number 15 is now I'm just going to, again, on texture, I'm going to use some of the celadon. So here I'm using root beer on the inside and sapphire on the outside. Now, when you're brushing texture, you only need to brush two coats on texture, but three coats on smooth. So here on the smooth parts, I'm doing three coats, but on the texture, I only am doing two coats. And then on the interior, I also brush three. Next is using a celadon with underglaze in carving. So this pot had carving on it. I'm putting underglaze in it first. Now I'm going to take my sponge and I'm just sponging off the extra underglaze. So it's just leaving the design 
uh, in the carving. And then I'm using sapphire on the inside. I'm doing some rainy day for the mountains, some peacock. Um, I meant to do key lime. I think somehow I forgot key lime. And then sapphire for the sky. So these should have a transparent effect. I'm doing three layers of those. Next is I'm using underglaze again and some carved lines. And uh, in the case of this, though, I am glazing the, the areas separately. And for this, I'm going to use the bulb syringe. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll paint the three layers on the inside. Now, if you want to use the bulb syringe, I do have them in the Rubbermaid tub. Just make sure that you see me when you check it out. And when you check it back in, I need to check it. The bulb syringe is designed to hold glaze and squeeze it through the little metal tip. Take the tip out. Make sure you don't have water in it and that it is clean. Squeeze the bulb. Insert the tip of it down into the glaze. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over and shake that glaze down to the bottom of it, squeeze out more air, and then when you put it back in, release it and it'll suck up more glaze. You can put the tip back in and then you can wipe off the excess glaze that you might have on there so you don't get it all over you. And then once you have it full of glaze, then you're ready to go ahead and glaze. Now you want to do this almost like you're just drawing with it. You squeeze and then kind of pull the glaze around as you squeeze, you're pulling around as you go. The whole time though, you should be squeezing to get enough glaze that's coming out. Squirt the glaze back in the jar when you're done. And then to wash it out, get like a, a water dish and you're going to run water through the bulb multiple times. And when that's clean, run a whole thing of clear water through the bulb. And then to check to see if it's actually clean, I squirt the back of my hand. If you see any clay residue, you know you need to do it again. So here I'm just doing another color. Now, I did note right here that you can wax over a glazed design and then you could dip if you would want to. So here I'm just cleaning again. I'm done with the red at this point, running the water through it again. And once you run an entire clear thing of water through it, you should be good. Now the last bit that I'm going to do here is I'm outlining with the outside color. But then I'm going to paint it in with a paintbrush to get three layers. You only need one coat if you use the bulb syringe. But if you paint with a paintbrush, you use three. So the advantage is it goes a little bit faster when you have detail area. Okay, and then lastly, I know it's a lot of cleaning out. That's the hardest thing about the bulb syringe is making sure it's really super clean. And again, I'm just cleaning off the bottom of my pots as I go. Now, lastly, I am going to clean out the grooves where perhaps I got some glaze inadvertently into the little black uh, under glaze lines. That helps to clean it out. And then I just kind of gently dust it with a soft brush and uh, whatever you do, don't try to refill underglaze on the lines. Next is the Shino family with black underneath it. Black is such a great base. If you want to do Shino's over the top, you get some really cool effects. You can use Shino's by themselves, but if you dip black first and then a Shino over the top, you can get some really pretty, pretty effects. It's kind of nice. And this is uh, light Shino over black. Next is celadons. The character of the celadon glazes are that they are transparent and they show texture gorgeously. So if you have a good texture on a pot, you might try a celadon. Now slip trailing is something that can be done, of course, in the greenware stage when you slip, uh, slip trail actually liquid slip onto it when it's leather hard. Here though, it's been bisque fired, so I'm just putting some underglaze on and I'm just trying to kind of accent the design a little bit that's on there. So we've done things similar to this before. I'm just leaving almost like a little black outline. And now I'm dipping this into the Celadon Dusty Rose because I'd like for it to be somewhat transparent and I want to be able to see the underglaze. And usually those Celadons will allow you to see that. Okay, so next is the Luster Glazing. Now here I have a bowl that's dipped in half matte white, which is alabaster satin white, and then half glossy white. It has been fired, and now after it's been fired, now I'm doing the 
over glaze, the luster glaze. So this has already been fired to cone six. And notice that I'm wearing gloves. You should normally be doing this out on the patio where you have excellent ventilation. Uh, the only reason I'm not out on the patio now is that the patio is all covered with snow. And then clean your luster brush off when you are done. You uh, Again, you want to wear the gloves so you're not touching the luster. Next one is Mishima. Mishima is a technique that's done with green wear. So I'm carving into it while the pot is leather hard. And then after I clean my carving, I'm now going to take black slip. So it's just slip where I've added a stain to it. And I'm filling it in with, I have a Ziploc bag and I'm just squeezing it through. So it's sort of like um, icing. Maybe I'm, I'm icing cookies or something. Once it's dry, then I'm going to scrape off the black slip and I'm left with an even surface where it just has uh, the black slip that's showing. Um, so it it's, works best, to be honest, on a non-grogged clay. This was grogged, but it'll still work. Now it's been bisque fired. So the slip has been bisque fired and everything. I, I'm dipping it into sapphire, which is, again, a celadon. So it's going to have a transparent look, and I should be able to see it. So you don't necessarily have to use clear, but you want to use a transparent. Next is I'm going to use some glaze for detail painting. Now, this blue pot is um, a satin pot, and I also did it on a glossy. I just forgot to film it. This one is the same sort of thing, but I'm using a blue underglaze on a white gloss. So I have a white gloss with normal cobalt glaze, a blue satin with normal cobalt, and now I have a white gloss with underglaze. So we'll do a comparison and see what they look like. Next is Scraffito. Scraffito is a glaze technique that's done in the greenware stage. You apply three to six layers of your um, underglaze. And uh, I do have cone six underglazes. These are coyote underglazes that I happen to be using. And then I'm just tidying up the edge. So once your underglaze is um, dry, dry enough that you can handle, then you can carve. Now, as I carve this, you can think about more than just lines. Think about carving away full areas. You know, you can carve away the background. It makes it much more interesting than if you just have skinny old lines in there, okay? And I, I'm just going to take a few minutes and uh, make sure that I'm cleaning up any rough edges with this. Um, it's a little bit harder to clean this when it's graffito, but then bisque fired. It gets bisque fired. Now I'm dipping it in clear. Now, after I did this, I realized, oh, nuts. I meant to glaze the inside with really red. So I tried something that I've never done before here. After the clear dried, I went ahead and I put a couple of coats of really red on the inside. I wasn't too sure what would be happening with this, but um, it does seem to work. It just gets a little clear near the top. And then we have two more things. We have the last, we have the Texas Two Steps. Now, the Texas Two Steps have an undercoat. So I have two undercoats. I have licorice and coffee bean. And they also have an overcoat. So the undercoat that I just did there, that's coffee bean. And then I'm dipping, this is my second coat that I'm dipping in the uh, blue moon. So you need to have a generous amount of coats. So I have two coats of blue moon over it. Now that's one coat of white marshmallow. And then when that dries again, I'm going to do one more little section of white mar marshmallow. Um, it really has to be dry between those coats. It might take you a couple days to get it all glazed, or you could also use a hair dryer. You can also, conversely, just brush Texas Two Steps, but be generous with your numbers of coats. So when you do the undercoat, the base coat, again, you have to have a minimum of three coats, so that's equivalent to a dip. And here I just poured the inside with the marshmallow and now I'm just going to do some stripes. Now, when you do this, though, keep in mind, it might take a while for it to dry. So again, you could wait a day or dry it with a hair dryer. Here I'm doing a second coat on the interior. 
and then another coat on the rim. And I'm notice I'm using the turntable and I'm just rotating the turntable. I'm holding the, the base part of the turntable. That makes it a little bit easier. I'm getting multiple coats on there. It's probably like four, at least four coats of the uh, overcoats there. So I've got both Marshmallow and Blue Moon. It's at, again, at least four coats of each of those. The heavier the coats get, the more pronounced your, um, kind of your spotted uh, look is that you get. Next, I'm doing the final cleaning of the foot. You always want to sponge not only the bottom, but up an eighth of an inch. This is so important. Uh, kids, I'm not going to be doing it for you. If you glaze down too far, it's going to get fused. So remember, you can take the pencil, rotate the pot up against the pencil, and that is going to make a line an eighth of an inch up. If you um, are unsure where to glaze, please do the pencil line. Okay, you want to make sure it's inside and outside of the foot. If you have a thick amount of glaze, maybe you have to uh, scrape it. You can always put something flat against the bottom to see how deep your foot is as to whether or not you should do that. Next, I'm going to make a patty. Take a golf ball size hunk and I'm just flattening it out and I'm stretching it. So I'm hitting the side closest to me first as I do this. Set your pot on the patty and cut it three quarters of an inch bigger than the base of the pot. Then go over to the light switch into the little silver basket and grab yourself a kiln ticket. You will be writing down, oh, and grab a wear board from the wear board rack. You're going to be filling out the kiln ticket to tell me everything that I need to know about the glaze. So set your patty on the wear board. Oops, and I almost picked that up with dirty fingers. Set your pot on the patty. Complete your kiln ticket. Okay, so notice again, it's three quarters of an inch bigger than the base of the pot all the way around. Complete your kiln ticket. You're going to have your name, your bell, the date, the clay body, which is stoneware in that case, the glaze names or numbers, uh, the cone of the glaze, check whether or not it's dinnerware safe, have you wiped the bottom and the corners up an eighth of an inch free of glaze, and then also have you made a tortilla thin patty. Just make sure those patties are thin like a tortilla. If they are too thick, it will blow up. It has to be thin because it needs to dry out in like an hour. Then put the whole board with your kiln ticket and your patty into the drying cabinet and remember to check those signs for advice. And check the next video that I have which I will show these fired pieces so you can see just what they look like when they come out of the kiln.